Hello, YouTube. Um, it is really late at night, and I'm sitting outside smoking a cigarette, which is why I'm all dark and spooky right now. Um, but I was just reading something um, from a lovely author named Simon Critchley. Some of you might have heard me talk about Slavoj Žižek before. It's his theoretical nemesis, actually. They, they got into a, a really interesting spat over the issue of violence. Um, but I was reading Critchley's latest book, entitled uh, The Faith of the Faithless, Experiments in Political Theology. Um, and uh, I came across a few passages that I thought were extremely beautiful, and I, I just wanted to read them to you. <clears throat> I hope that's okay. Um, he's talking here about Agamben's reading of Paul and Badiou's reading of Paul and specifically on the issue of faith, and I think it's very moving. Um, so here we go. Agambem links faith to the experience of making an oath, the domain of what he calls pre-law. Such an oath is a kind of pledge, or what I have called above a proclamation. It is something that one swears. In this pre-creedal, pre-juridical experience of faith, there is no split between belief in God the Father and God the Son, as in the Nicene Creed, even if they are two aspects of the same Trinitarian ontological substance. Furthermore, and crucially for Agambem, faith is not ontological at all. It is not that Jesus is the Messiah, where the latter is the predicate of the former. Rather, faith, faith is expressed in the more compressed pledge of the factum, Jesus Messiah. Being is not something that we can predicate of Christ through a constantive proposition, or even Hegel's speculative copula. Rather, Jesus Messiah is something otherwise than being, or beyond essence, to coin a phrase. Similarly, Jesus Messiah is beyond existence, or rather, he is not proven through the fact of the historical Jesus. As Paul makes clear in Galatians, when Jesus Christ was revealed to Paul in order that he might preach amongst the Galatians, quote, I did not confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, end quote. Galatians 1.16 to 17. Rather, he disappeared into Arabia, which scholars suggest refers to somewhere in modern Syria or Jordan. Thus, the experience of faith cannot be explained with reference to the category of being, whether conceived as essence or existence. As Agambem makes clear, between the words Jesus and Messiah, there is no elbow room into which the copula might squeeze its way. Faith, then, is the performative force of the words Jesus Messiah, nothing more but nothing less. This is what Agambem calls the effective experience of the pure power of saying. Faith is a word, a word whose force consists in the event of its proclamation. The proclamation finds no support within being, whether conceived as existence or essence. Agambem links this thought to Foucault's idea of veridication, or truth-telling, where the truth lies in the telling alone. But the thought could equally be linked to Lacan's distinction, inherited from Benveniste, Benveniste maybe, uh, between the orders of enunciation, the subject's acts of, act of speaking, and enuncié, the formulation of this speech act into a, into a statement or a proposition. Indeed, there are significant echoes between this idea of faith as proclamation and Levinas' conception of the saying, which is the performative act of addressing and being addressed by another, and the said, which is the formulation of that act into a proposition of the form S is P. We are dealing here, as we saw in the introduction, with a performative idea of truth, as trough, as an act of fidelity or being true to, rather than a propositional or empirical idea of truth. Truth is conceived as what, in a rather nicely antiquated English, can be called troth plight, the faithful act of pledging or proclaiming. 
truth as troth has, has to be underwritten by love. The proclamation of faith is an act of betrothal, where one weds oneself to another and where the other is one's fiancé. This recalls the famous line of thinking from 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul insists that if faith is not underwritten by love, then I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. The context here, of course, is the polemic against glossolia, or speaking in tongues that seemingly crept into the Corinthian congregation. But if faith is a troth plight that proclaims the calling of an infinite demand, then the proclamation has to be supported by love which bears all things, which, quote, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things, end quote, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Faith without love is a hollow clanging that lacks the subjective commitment to endure. As Paul puts it in Galatians, for in Christ... For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. Galatians 5.6 This is a point that Bidou makes well in his reading of Paul. If faith is the coming forth of this subject in the proclamation of an infinite demand, then love is the labor of the subject that has bound itself to its demand in faith. Love is what gives consistency to a subject, and which allows it to persevere with what Badu calls a process of truth. Love like faith Love like faith does not allow for copulative predication. It does not assemble predicates of the beloved as reasons for love. As Agambem insists in a curious example, given the name of Jesus' mother, the love the lover says, I love beautiful brunette tender Mary not, I love Mary because she is beautiful, brunette, and tender. Love has no reason, and it needs none, and if it did, it wouldn't be love. I just thought that that passage was extremely beautiful. I wanted to share it. Critchley, by the way, is an atheist, um, but I think he gives a really moving and interesting reading of Christianity, um, and uh, that's something that that interests me. Um, so, yeah, have a good night. Sorry about how creepy the video is and how terrible I am at pronouncing words in other languages. Um, have a good night.